Another episode of The Oddest Couple. I'm Felix Levine. Across from me is the star of the show, John A. Light. A quick reminder, as per usual, we are promoting our Legacy 11 vodka that you see here on the table. It is 11 times distilled, 11 times filtered, sugar-free, and gluten-free. Um, so go check that out. We'll have that in the description of this video. If you want to, if you haven't signed up to our Patreon channel, go to our Patreon channel. The link is in the description of this video as well. Uh, make sure you like this video, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. We've been putting out content very, very consistently. Um, some really great episodes recently that have, have done uh, not only very well, but also a lot of people have a lot of things to say about them. So it's good. We just love the engagement. Whether you love us, whether you hate us, drop a comment. Let us know what you think of the videos. Let us know if there's any topics you want us to cover in the future. We're open to all of it. But today, um, we're going to talk about, obviously, somebody that you know extremely, extremely well. Um, there's a new Netflix documentary on him. He is uh, arguably the most famous mobster ever. Um, in a public guy, I would say him and Capone were um, the most in the media, I, w I, would, I would say, out of most gangsters. If you talk about uh, you know, some famous gangsters out there and, you know, on uh, Italian mafia. Gotti Sr. Yeah. Um, and because there's, there's his new uh, Netflix documentary, Get Gotti, um, a lot of people in the, in the space have, have touched on it. Um, so we wanted to obviously touch on it as well. And I think like the most natural progression, and we've done some things here and there on Gotti over the years, but nothing recently, nothing obviously with the, the new documentary. I think more than anybody on any of these other channels, you have the most insight because you were his right-hand man. Um, I guess we'll start with his his rise. Like, so people understand if they haven't watched a documentary or don't know that much, how did John Gotti get to be John Gotti? Well, John Gotti had a brother, Jeannie Gotti, that actually uh, got straightened out first. That was my cellmate in prison for a while back in uh, 90, 1996. John got known. He was a he was a low level criminal like most guys thought, and hijacking and uh, small crimes that he was getting locked up on, on and off. But his rise was when Gambino's nephew was kidnapped uh, by McBratney, and uh, they're in I think it was Snoop's uh, Snoopy's uh, bar, where they grab him and they kill him. Um, when Angelo Ruggiero is with him and another guy uh, uh, that actually does the shooting. But uh, he goes to Lewisburg Prison and he, he takes a manslaughter charge and he did about three, three years, three and a half years for that. And that's what really elevated him into a position where everybody knew who he was. And uh, Angelo Ruggiero was known as to be his cousin. They grew up together. They weren't blood cousins, but they were called cousins by everybody. And Angel's the one that actually had the hook with Neil Della Croce, it was his uncle. So for the people that don't know, that's who actually brought him into the mob world, into that level. And uh, John gets uh, well known from that, from that moment on. So is it just the manslaughter? Like a lot of guys do have manslaughter charges. Why Why did he then capitalize on that? Well, he capitalized it because it was a Gambino uh, nephew at, at the time. And uh, so it was a big name and uh, it was a big hit w when they hit him. So that's really what brought him the notoriety because of who it was and uh, why he killed him. So then after that, how does he go from low-level criminal, a little bit of notoriety to then like really like making a name for himself and establishing himself as the the next guy or the guy? Well, he comes in and he, he becomes a well-known figure now uh, around the mob world and especially the Gambino family. And uh, uh, Danny and Charlie Wagner were uh, the guys that uh, ran the Bergen and Hunt and Fish Club back in those days on 101st Avenue. And he steps in behind them. They, they're obviously getting older. And as they're getting older, they need somebody to take over as uh, the captain in that area, and it becomes John. 
because of some of those things and some other things he was doing. Uh, he started getting known as, as a, a tough guy on the street, and he brought a big, a big crew with him of guys that he grew up with, and his brother Jeannie actually had most of these guys, and I spoke about one of them last week that I happened to like personally was uh, Joey Scopo, who was known as uh, Shylock, big money on the street with Jeannie, and uh, tough guy. Um, and Joey was very close uh, with John Gotti as... And John would call guys all the time to tell the kid this, you know. He would refer to Joey as kid, but he was very close. And he would tell stories about Joey Scopa when he was down the block. He ran the union, for the people who don't know, 6A union that his father had. And this is also a famous uh, crew of guys because the father, Ralphie Scopa, ran that that uh, union prior to Joey taking it over. But And the reason Ralphie got famous because he was involved in the commission case in 85, that Paul Castellano and the rest of the bosses of the five families were involved in, and they all get convicted. Uh, Ralph gets convicted also. Um, and that case comes from the bugging of his car. So that really initiated, uh, they bugged his car, and they were talking union business in the car, which was one of the reasons why it was a big takedown. And when he goes to prison, gets convicted, Joey takes over, and John is basically co controlling that faction. And Joey Scopo is uh, the street boss, acting boss, while Vic Arena was in prison. And there's a split off of factions of the Colombo family with Persico. And then there's a war pursuing in, uh, in the early 90s. And Joey ends up getting hit on the street. And uh, John was, again, very close in controlling that faction of, of the Colombo family. Inadvertently, he's controlling it. And Joey's coming down by our club. And, so th these are some of the moves that John's mm -hmm. making because of some, a lot of it because of Jeannie's friendships and Joey uh, being around with them. And John starts utilizing partially the Colombo family, the Bonanno family with Joe Messina he's close to. And John brings in, as he's growing, he starts bringing these guys in as uh, the uh, commission of... Uh, the five families, which the Bonanno family was X'd out because of the heroin trade. And John starts to maneuver him as he's growing in status. So when do you think John decided in his own mind, I'm going to become the leader? I'm going to become the guy? Because it kind of sounds like initially when he first started out any kind of organized crime, he didn't have maybe the intention of being like the number one, maybe. Or well, do you think, or do well you I just gave you the fast version of after they hit Paul Castellano, he becomes a boss and he takes these these guys in. And the reason he takes them in is he could fight the the anybody that's saying he doesn't have three families to decide you can hit a sitting boss. He maneuvers it. The thing that makes John, and did he have the uh, aspiration to become the boss? Yeah, he did. He As he's growing in, in status and as people are starting to know him, he had a personality, of, you know, he had a charisma. The, the biggest thing, and I've said it before, the biggest thing John had over everybody else, he had a charisma. You, yeah. you either have that or you don't have it. That was one of his, you know, traits that he had that was a good trait about him. The other one was he was very personable if you knew him. If you knew him and if he liked you, he was a fun guy to go party with. He liked to be out in the street. He didn't want to stay home. He did that one day a week with his family. He loved the street. He never hid that fact. And anybody that really knew him, he liked to be in swanky places. He liked, you know, steakhouses and, and nightclubs. And, uh, you know, later on, he kept an image that he didn't like fast boats and 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 things like that. But he did. He he would get on the back of a Harley with some bikers when he was in trouble. And people don't know that about him. Yeah. He started staying with some bikers that were hired him at one time when he was in trouble. And there was a guy, Philly Broadway, from down at Cherry Hill that also helped him hide when he was in trouble, but he later on, he gets a, a speedboat, a cigarette boat, what we call, we all had them back in the 80s, it would said not guilty. And then he started that part of his life right. also, because he was kind of like the Elvis Presley of the, of the mob. Right, but, but do you think that when he first went into the mob stuff, he had intentions of being John number one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, you know, he, he ran a gang uh, back in, uh, he's from, you know, uh, Brownsville area, and he ran he ran a gang there in, in Brownsville. So he always had that, 
mentality to, mm -hmm. to, to run things. He wasn't one of those guys that could take orders well. And the, one of the reasons he had disdain for uh, Paul Castellano was because he didn't like taking orders from him. He looked at him as a soft businessman, and John didn't want to be a businessman. You know, he, he would openly say that. Right. I'm a gangster. I ain't a businessman. So he to, he he gets into this role or this opportunity, right? With the with the Castellano hit, like everything everything was set up for him to be. Well, I said this before. You know, the the thing that gets him into the position for the Castellano hit is Castellano has two trials going on. He has the commission case going on that he's out on a bail from, and he also has the Roy DeMeo case. That Roy DeMeo just got hit because they thought he was going to flip on the cases. And we just did an episode on him. So, he, right, that episode just hit, I think, and is out. So we talk about the Roy DeMeo case. But what John does, he utilizes his brother and Angelo Ruggiero, and they all got caught on tapes uh, on the heroin trade, on trade. And Paul wants those tapes. And if I said this, and I've always said this, John utilized, he knew Paul couldn't hit him at that time. He had two cases open. He was facing life sentences. And he was asking for the tapes, Paul. John wouldn't turn over the tapes. And his answer to his guys were, if I hand these, these tapes, he's going to have us killed. John maneuvered these guys because he wasn't having anybody killed. He already had his hands full, Paul, Paul at that time. But what he would have did was shelve these guys mm. and maybe ask John, you have to kill uh, Angelo, or even his brother. Who knows what Paul would have asked because of these tapes. But he, Paul himself wasn't going to have anybody hit at that time. He, had, he was just overwhelmed with cases. But John took that and maneuvered it and manipulated it and told his guys, if we don't hit him first, he's going to hit us because he knew that he could take the status of boss. And then he started bringing guys in. What year was that again? 85. So then... When December sixteenth is actually when they hit Paul. When do you? When did you? When had you met uh, Gotti Senior for the first time? Probably around eighty two. And you started working for him or right 81, then. Eighty one, eighty two, something like that. Yeah, I started with the. I got into the sports business with the New York Mets betting with me, and that famous check that came out and it was on the front page of the papers that they paid us uh, uh, through the man the equipment manager and so I could. Did you do that? directly with the equipment manager? Yeah, yeah. So I couldn't handle that money. They were betting big money. And uh, so I go to John, and John brings me to Willie Boy Johnson, who runs John's bookmaking business, and I go on a 50%. They call it half sheet. And uh, I'd, I'd work out at Avenue U office down by King's Plaza with Willie Boy Johnson, and he brings me him, and then John brings me other guys, he brings me Ali, uh, Lizard, and these big, big right. uh, money guys, millionaires that are betting, and I'm going back in the 80s. They're betting 10000 a game, and they bet the whole board. So I couldn't handle that kind of action. So he says, take their action. I'll give you your guys. You know, he's throwing me a bone. He could give them right directly to his own office <coughs> with, with Willie Boy Johnson. So he's giving me the, these guys, they start betting with me, and he's trying to help me earn, and, and then I call the action into Willie Boy, mm. And if they hit me, Willie Boy pays the, the thing, and I work off a, a black or red, what they call it. So if I make money, I split it. If I lose money, they pay, and I got to work it off. So what are the conversations like with John at the time, you and him specifically, about like his rise and, and what the next steps were to... Well, as, as I'm moving, I mean, the people that are on our Patreon, I you, you put those tapes out, I believe, a couple yeah. of years ago at at the Raven night when I'm coming in out of the club. Yeah. People ask you, you know, what are you talking about? You know, because he kicked everybody out if you watch the tapes. I'm the last guy in with him. And, you know, he's giving you orders. He's whispering in your ear. And he's telling you, you know, he, they listen, like anything else, you groom, they groom you since you're a kid. And some of the things that they make you do is hurt guys. Like mm -hmm. this, it was a tough guy. I figured who brought, oh, Gene brought it up on our last show about a guy, Frankie Lapp, big guy, tough guy. Uh, a lot of guys feared him in the neighborhood, and John asked me to go hurt him. I don't got nothing against this guy. Actually, I like the guy, and you know he's got a good mother. He's got, you know, he's a good guy. He's a tough guy, not no. And 
these are the things that they start asking you to do. Hurt this guy for their own reasons of what's going on in the drug business at the time. So, you know, when John starts telling me to do these things, these orders start coming out on different guys. Uh, you know, there was hit. You know, there was different uh, guys that they were asking me to hit that were, were hurt that uh, starts grooming you. And this is how John gets his reputation is not just from me, but he's got 10 and 20 guys going out and hitting guys, hurting guys. So, well, first, were, were you, did you see him every day? Yeah, every day. You know, every day from like 82 to 85? Uh, mostly. I got stabbed up at one time, so I stopped coming around a little bit while I was in and out of the hospital. And then at one time, I, I've said this on one of the shows, I don't come to the club. And I still think I'm a kid. I'm really not understanding. And he sees I'm not there, and he sends his brother Pete and Richie uh, Gotti to my house. And they're beeping the horn out front of the house. They're pulled up in a Lincoln. And, uh, you know, at the time, uh, Pete's not a made guy. And he says, uh, my grandmother says, uh, Johnny, there's somebody here who to call some older guys. I mean, they weren't older guys. I'm young then, so they're probably in their late 30s. And uh, so I go outside, you know, kiss them hello, and we start talking. And they says, where the fuck are you? I said, what do you mean? He says, my brother's looking for you. He wants you at the club. So I says, look at me. What does he want? He, he's mad. You haven't been around the last week or so. Then I understood. So when I go there, he, he takes me for a walk. And he says to me, uh, you got to be here every day. You report every day. You don't just not show up. Now I understand this is a job. This is serious. Mm -hmm. This ain't like just playing around anymore. Yeah. I want you here every day. You come there. He wanted me there at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Usually he'd show up around that time. He liked to sleep late. He'd pull up, but he wanted the guys. He wanted whatever guys are there. And then he'd bark orders at you, whatever he wanted you to do or not do. And, uh, or he'd tell me in a specific, again, he would tell me, run down the block because Joey Scopel's club was down there. And there's obviously things to talk about, about the unions. And for people who don't know, that, that union controlled a lot. And most of these jobs, they give the mob, the, the five families they'd give them, this is what the, the commission case was about. They would give them 2% of the job take of any big job over a $2 million stip it would be. Mm. Anything under that, they would leave you alone. But for the most part, well, you'd have to just pay your own guys, right. your own crew, your own captain, but the rest would go to the commission. So he would send me down to Joey's and say, hey, go down there. And uh, he would go, he, he loved Joey Scopo. Everybody loved Joey Scopo. You know, so I went to go see Joey Scopo. Actually, when I go see him, he's taking a walk with a burly guy. And I never seen Joey Scopo lose his temper, actually. And I say to John later on, I tell him the story. I said, I'm walking there. Joey's walking up the block. And he gives me a finger. He says, one second. And uh, I walk over to him. And he palmed the guy in the side of the head. And the guy went down. Joey was strong, burly, uh, always a gentleman. And, and I said to John, yeah, Joey just uh, you know, hit a guy. He goes, and John just kept, that's, John had to smirk when he would, when he was, when he liked something. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, he's a tough, he's a, he says, uh, he's a tough kid. And he says, Joey's a tough kid. He says, I, you know, and then he always said, I, I love this kid. I like this kid. When he's a made guy, not, a, it's not no kid. Right. Elevates the acting boss. But the difference of Joey Scope and some of these guys I spoke about was Joey's a boss. He would come over to you and kiss you alone. And in our life, in our protocol, you're supposed to go to them. He was just a gentleman, you know. So anyway, get back to John. John really liked him. And these are some of the moves John was making. And, you know, when people say, well, he wasn't in the construction. Yes, he was. He was calling the shots from behind the scenes. For you, how much strategy did John talk with you? I mean, you know, they're going to talk. We had a sit down one time at Kono's and he was mad at me because I went and I pistol whipped the guy from, I went to several times I was shaking him down. Me and Bobby Borrello were told to go there and shake him down. And it happened to be Philly Broadway, the guy was just talking about, that took him on a run. So Joey, uh, Joe Carrazzo was there at the time. He was uh, just a mate guy. He wasn't a concierge at the time. And we're in a basement of, of Kono's and I'm sitting next to him and he's, yelling at me. He yells at Bobby Borrello and tells him to get off the table. And he's trying to ask me who sent me there. But I won't answer. So, you know, I don't want to give anybody up. But he knows everything but prior. 
and he blames Bobby, he kicks Bobby out of the room, he abuses him bad in front of Philly, and then he slaps me in front of him, you know, and uh, I was steaming that I got hit in front of a table full of guys. Yeah. And obviously, you know, you're looking at him as he's your boss, and you're looking at him because you look at him like your father, and he's hitting you in front of people. And uh, after everybody gets dismissed, and he makes me apologize to the guy, and I'm like, why the fuck are they hit me? Make me apologize. These guys are the ones that sent me. You know, when I get an order from somebody, because I would be with the regime, right? you don't question, well, who asked me? We know it's coming from him, or we assume it is, unless somebody's going around him. And later on, we go upstairs in Konos. It's in Maspeth, and it was a place John liked to go to and, and uh, sit quietly. And anyway, he sends everybody home, and I'm sitting next to him, and you know, he says, have a drink. And I shake my head. I'm not talking. And he called me like a, like a conto, whatever. But he didn't <laughs> use that word. I forget the word he used. And he goes, kid, he goes, you got to understand something. And he explains to me now. He goes, this is my friend, Philly. It's his guy. It, you know, I shouldn't have to tell you this. He's, and then he tells me when I went on a run and I was in Cherry Hill because I lived down in Cherry Hill. He goes, you know, I used to be in Cherry Hill too because he knows I had a house down there. And he explains to me, he goes, he's the one that hit me. It's his guy. It's embarrassing that I don't know what's going on that we're shaking down mm -hmm. his guy. You know, he says, you know how I feel, but, but I, I have to right. do that to show this guy some respect. He goes, it's not person. I have a fucking drink, he said. Stop. So I started drinking with him. And uh, there was somebody outside waiting, and he kicked him out. And he says, you know, you drive me home. So I'm looking at him, uh -huh. and I'm smiling. Like, I'm, I'm there, but then I, I stopped <clears throat> pounding. Oh, that's the word he did use. He goes, stop pouting. He says, you know, and John, and when you're with John, especially one on one like that, he's a fucking nice guy. You know, the, the, despite all his life or what he did or didn't do, who likes or who didn't like it, he, on a one on one, he's very nice. Like, you know, we used to go to with his family to Alta Donis every weekend. He'd go to dinner, and half the time I'm there. I used to bring my ex wife, and we'd go to dinner, and, you know, and he treats you very well, I, I, I got to say. Like, he wasn't. Hey, go get that. He wasn't that type of guy. Hey, get up and go get me the way. He, he didn't do that. You know, so there was some good qualities mm -hmm. that outside people weren't close. Well, when, you know, on Saturdays I spoke about this, only made guys sat at the table. He gave me that spot. He gave me a chair at that table every week. So everybody understood right. the position I had with the father and I'm with the regime. And, and then, you know, he'd have me out hurting guys on a regular. So, uh, you know, I've talked about several guys he would, uh, you know, over the years that he would tell me, go hurt this guy. Serious guys, uh, positions that, you know, he would ask me to hit or hurt. So then when do you think he was at his most powerful? Uh, I'd say he started at his most powerful in about 84, right before the Castellano hit. Everybody knew what was going to happen around us anyway. Uh, and, you know, so before the hit of Castellano, you're not allowed to bring guns to the club. Oh, and why? Because if there's any raids or pinches or anything. Oh. Guns. And so, but at this point, now he's telling me to bring guns and he's telling me to keep everybody on call because he's figuring there might be a war on this, just like the Columbos were going back and forth mm -hmm. killing each other. And actually, Joey Scopo gets hit about... 92, 93, he gets, he, he gets hit a couple of months after his father dies in jail. And I think it was about five or six months later, Joey gets killed. And that's the, he's the, the ending guy that gets killed in that war, uh, the Columbo War, over the fight over the factions. Right. But uh, that's when I think John got the, the, the strongest, about 84, you know, where, where you could see that he's pulling power. And, and people would ask me that, well, how do you know? Because, you know, you, know, you see other crews right. coming there. To see them, they're not supposed to be at our club. They're coming from Jersey. They're coming from the Cavacanti family. They're coming down from Philadelphia. They're coming down from, you know, different areas. Genovese family guys would come see him, and so you understand that he's sought to move in, in a different direction, where he's he's pulling some power, and he had some loyal guys like Joey Scopo's friends. He had th those guys around that become made guys in the Gambino family. He's got guys like Little Jackie, Tommy Sneakers. These guys. Were, Nice guys. That whole crew of guys, very nice guys. Not killers, uh, Joey and uh, J uh, Jackie and Tom. I mean, they're capable, don't get me wrong, but they're not. that's not their thing. You know, they're just more 
uh, loyal to the, to that regime of John and and the family and money making and you know running numbers and stuff like that. How much? So, for like an, a a novice, like who was on your level when it came to your relationship with John? Like, there's John, then you're. No, well, the as, best as, way I can say it on my level is when he would ask me if somebody asked who I was with. You're not supposed to say, "Hey, I'm with John. I'm with that." Blah, blah, blah. You know, you, you got to let them go reach out. So your answer would go go reach out to to, to uh, Ozone Park. That's they know who to go reach out to. And you know, if you if somebody said to you on a personal level, you know, and this is his words, would tell me just tell me you're with the regime. In other words, you're with the inner f- circle, the family, uh, uh, the Gotti family, that are made guys at that time. So that would be you know Pete, his son, himself. And that that would be the regime and Jeannie, obviously, but Jeannie goes to jail. When do you think John started getting a little nervous that because part of the uh, and I've only watched parts of the doc um, is you know, I don't watch those shows. I don't I didn't even watch my own when I was in Fear City. I watch a little parts of why? it because I grew up with them. Why do I got to watch <laughs> whatever image they're trying to project of them? You didn't watch yourself at all in Fear City? No, a little bit here and there. You know, I watched little spots. I never sat down and watched it and said, oh, there's no reason to because I've done enough talks about it, shows about it. Uh, There's enough videos of me, you know, picking John up when they, you know, that famous video with the police around the car. I'm picking John up from court. And uh, they pull us over because I have a gun, somebody rather that I had a gun and I left the gun in the candy store next door uh, club on, oh. at the Raven night yeah, and they didn't know that I left it there wait that's a funny story so you you pick him up from court with a gun or I right before I, I, right before you pick him up I go in the car and I get out and I run in to get and I say I'm going to get some uh, those candies you put in your mouth whatever they are mints and uh, I leave the gun behind the counter we know the guy and I tell him hey leave this back here I'll be back in a couple minutes I'll pick it up of course, he ain't going to say anything. He can't say anything. And then you go pick up God. Then I get in the car, and whoever knew I had the gun on me. So at that time, Jerry Shetgal is, is, is Gotti's lawyer and a couple other people. And so they surround the courthouse, and there's cameras everywhere, and they attack the car. And they're looking for the gun from me. That's the reason why they pull us over. And later on, when, I, when I'm talking to John, he smiles, and he goes... You know, he had that look. Like, he, when he's not, when he's mad, you'll know it. When he's not mad, you'll know it. <laughs> what, what was the mad look? Or what was the mad feeling? The mad feeling is he was, like, even when we had that sit down at Konos, we thought we were going there for another reason. Uh-huh. So he see me in front of the club, he goes, and he used to point his finger like this. How many times did I tell you to slow down? How many times did I tell you, be here at 8 o'clock? And then he goes, then he'll tell you, and I'm saying, and he says, and I say eight o'clock, be there at eight o'clock. Like, you knew when he was mad. Yeah, yeah. And he didn't yell. He just, he'd get in your face. He'd bend over and get in your face. And you'd say, oh, oh now you get the butterflies yeah, in yeah. your stomach because you don't know what's on his mouth. <laughs> you know, you'll threaten, I'll chop your fucking head off. I'll kill you. But I tell everybody, you can't do what I did and him not like you or I'd be dead. It's yeah. as simple as that. You yeah, know, everybody, yeah. when they question things, then why am I still alive? Why didn't the guy kill me? Because I was very close with him and, you know, he he like I had a lot in common with him. He used he grew up in East New York, Jamaica. Yeah, he went to Lane High School, so did I. He hid in Cherry Hill. That's where I originally went. We had a lot of things in common, and you know, and so he looked at me. I come from no money. He came from no money, and you know, so he he took a liking to me as a kid. I was always around. Come holidays at his house, you know, it'd be at Altadonna's with him. I'm in his daughter's wedding party. You know, these things don't happen if you're not. He sent me to. Vegas when she went on a honeymoon to make sure that you know they were okay to uh, pick up the wedding dress you know with the fam with her and you know so these are the things one after another I met all the weddings with their families and uh, just you know he you know there was a, a, a different uh, relationship because he knows me since I'm a kid. But how do you like obviously show the respect without like kissing his ass? You, you, listen, you, we all did it, not just me. He wore a tie. I'll give you examples. He wore a tie. We dressed, we'd all, you know, copy the way he's dressing. 
He'd wear a lot of mock necks with suits. We all started wearing mock necks with suits. If he had a suit on that we bought and he had it on, we go home and we don't let him see it. We go change. You don't wear it. If you had the same tie as him and you seen it, you go change. Mm-hmm. So he'd get a kick out of it. He's not stupid. He sees everything. He'd get a kick, he'd get a kick out of it too. You know, he, he knew the way we respected him. And, you know, he demanded that respect, but she deserved that respect. He, you know, he's in and out of prisons. Right. He's doing what he's doing. He's risking his life. And he lost his life in this life. So regardless of liking him or not, these are the things. I mean, there was a lot of guys, they all try to claim they were around through everything. They're not. There were so many guys that weren't around through a lot of this. And, uh, you know, there's another guy that was around since we were kids, a Mark, that we don't talk about a lot. But eventually we'll he'll come on and we'll talk but that really knows the uh the family and him do you think so how many times did Gotti go to jail oh he when he was younger he was in and out of jail a lot but when he was in power cases when he was in power he got hit with like five or six cases i mean he got hit one when he knocked out the russian guy over a parking spot with the the little frankie uh frankie the beard he got into he had the state case. I mean, he's had about five cases. He had a couple of RICO cases. I think what's funny is like when you look at the the tapes of him, even though when like when you pick him up from jail or um, or court, and when he's you know in and out of these courtrooms, like he's always smiling. Like he always liked kind of feeling like got you. Like I'm or or you're not gonna get me. Well, you or gotta, like you you got to remember he also knows and Mikey scars who was a skipper with the Gambino family, and he, you know, he cooperated, he gave some 302s. He talks about how me, him, and other guys were, we were involved in the scheme of getting to the juries. So he knows we get into the juries from. Right. So it's a little easier also, like Bruce Cutler was all over TV. He's not a bad attorney. He was partners with Richie Raybach at the beginning. Richie Raybach was John Gotti's attorney first. Then John gives me Richie Raybach. So Richie Braybuck becomes my attorney. He actually saved me in the case when I stabbed the guy in the throat in Florida because the lawyer asked Richie Raybuck, hey, uh, he knew he was Gotti's lawyer. He goes, is this kid involved with him? And Richie just smiled and said, yeah. And then his clients just kind of didn't want to press charges anymore. And, you know, so there was some good things that he did. But John understood uh, controlling people. And he knew that some of this stuff would control people. And when Bruce Cutler wasn't a bad lawyer, like I was starting to say, but we got to the juries. He knew we got to the juries. Obviously, he's behind all our moves of us setting up teams to get to the juries. Either we were paying them off or, we're, or you know, we're uh, intimidating them. And, you know, we had a team of us doing it. So, you know, that's all in Mikey Scott's 302s. What did you learn most from John about how to control people? Uh, he, there was a silence about him when he needed to be where you knew he was really mad and then it was uh, he did certain things that here's one of them we're all out to dinner and no one touches that plate until he touches his plate right no one gets up to go anywhere without asking him nobody wears the same clothes as him he did so many things to to intimidate people. This is a guy that didn't go to school, you got to remember. Even if you went but to the But he was educated, like, he liked to read. He, he, you know, and he, he read books, you know, like like I always talk about Machiavelli, The Prince. I mean, he, you know, so he, he was educated in manipulating people's and intimidating people. So he just, he knew how to do it. So like even, so if you're at dinner and like you need to go to the bathroom, you have to ask him? Tell him. Yeah, John's all right, I go to the bathroom. Oh, wow. Whoever said, not just me, men. It's crazy. It feels like school. Well, it was a control. Like he ran it like the army. You know, he. It was you. If you were in the army and you were a, you, you were in formation, you know, until they tell you at ease, you're not at ease. You know, there's days when we're just playing around and he's you know whatever. And when he was drinking, some guys are shitty drunks and some guys are nice drunks. The more he drank, the nicer he was, <laughs> and he let his hair down. You know, for New Year's or this or that. You know, we used to go every year, the whole family, to the El Carib for a Christmas party. And, you know, so these are some of the things that he would do. You know, the, he was smart. You know, he was like, you know, our baseball team, we weren't allowed in college 
to have to be part of a, a fraternity. The, our fraternity was the baseball team. He basically had the same rule, you know, he, because he figured the friendlier you are with guys, the more loyal you are to the guys, and you won't betray your guys. So we try to keep it that way. The downfall was the more he had everybody together and showed power and unity is the surveillance tapes and the bugs and, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. Did you ever, like, how big are usually the dinners when you're when with we, him? When we were at the club on on the uh, during the week on Saturday afternoons, it was, I don't know, 50 to 100 guys would show up to pay homage to him. And then we'd probably have about, let me see, 10, 20, well, about 25 guys that would eat. You have a couple small tables that were put on the side of our table and then one in the kitchen. So you would have a couple of guys. But it was just... May, uh, May guys at the table. And he always paid? No, this is, we have guys cook for us oh. every Saturday and our personal. His Bergen and Hunt Fish Club was his club. There was two clubs there. Then across the street, we had, a, he had a little office on the other side. It was a, and then around the corner from that was his brother's, uh, Richie's Cafe. So we'd be on those two blocks. How many people did Senior kill, you think? Well, actually, Paul, you know, all these murders that he, I know what he was charged with. He was charged with about 20 murders. But Paul Castellano actually had more guys hit than he did. And a lot of this is not really, you know, that's why he said a lot of these aren't his murders that Sammy put on him. So, you know, the real figure of those murders, honestly, I wouldn't say. He, he, John talked a lot when he was mad. But he had a pretty decent heart. He wasn't a cold-blooded, like, just kill this guy, kill that guy, kill this guy. And it's not that he had to go out and do it. He could have me do it. He could have Johnny Koenig do it. He have Tony Roach do it. He could have Angelo do it. He had Iggy do it. He had a lot of guys. Skinny Dom do it. He, he didn't really abuse his power like that. The, the thing that people don't get is the problem is once they kill Paul, and this is why I abuse Sammy, you're supposed to be his guy. You didn't kill one guy back. So you, what happened yeah. to you being that killer? Well, now you got to kill guys that are shooting. You know, in the Colombo War, the Colombo families, when the, during the war, they were tough on both sides. They were killing left and right. They were, they were sleeping together. Six, like in, you watch the movie The Godfather where they're all going to the mattresses, mean everybody's going to the guns. They're staying together because every time you stray by yourself, a guy's getting hit. So they try to stay in teams of guys. Mm. But uh, we didn't do that. They hit a lot of our guys. I says, and that's on Sammy. Never hit nobody back. He didn't even kill the, anybody who killed his best friend, Frankie De Chico. So I said last time somebody asked me, you know, they write dumb comments. Oh, he was the underboss. And Kamala Harris is the vice president. And she's a moron, so is he. So there's reasons to put people in positions. And it's as simple as that. It's not, it's not about just why is the person there. Well, ask somebody why Kamala Harris is there. And they all understand it's the best way to, to relate it. Okay, so then, and I think you touched on this in a, in a past show, but when Castellano gets hit, when's the first time you see Gotti right after? For the people that don't understand, before the hit, they go to Neil Della Croce, who's dying in a hospital, and he's trying to get his approval. And John's close to Neil. And he, and he respects him. But at one point, he finally tells him, we're going to move with the hit because Neil's going to die anyway. So he finally says, all right, this guy's not going to make it. Let's, let's do the hit. And you know he, the hit's coming. So for people that question nonsense that don't know any better about this life is when he tells me to bring guns and have guys around. You know what's coming. It doesn't, doesn't have to be. You're not sitting here discussing the plot of the murder. And no different than, you know, for the people who don't know, it was Frankie DeChico that planned this hit with John's guys. And they met, and and so when Sammy tells this story about him setting it up, not true at all. He wasn't there. He doesn't even know where they were meeting, what park they met at, because they met at a park to talk about it. And, you know, this way there was no wiretaps. And they made sure they walked the park when they, when they before the hit. So when these guys are talking, they don't have knowledge. People don't know. They, you know, they watch too many video games. 
and they think they understand the intricacies of how the mafia world works. So then when did you see Gotti for the first time after that? A uh, day later. And do you guys talk about it? No, no, nobody's, everybody's kissing him, you know, and talking about what's, geez, what happened, you know, and, you know, what smiles, because everybody knows, but there is no open discussion about, oh, he did it. Now they got to have a, a vote of who's going to run the family now, and which obviously the fix is already in. So they're going to have all the captains get together, and there's not a, st a stupid enough captain to say, oh, I don't want him to run it, or right. he's going next. And, you know, so people that don't know, he used to play Continental, and actually the guy I'm talking about, Mark, used to keep score at the Continental game for everybody, and Pete Castellano shows up a week or two later to have a game. So Paul has a brother, Pete, mm -hmm. that actually comes to the game, and you know he's coming to the game because he doesn't want to get killed, and he's going to donate and lose. <laughs> so, right. you know, and listen, they play for big money. They play for 300, 400, even 500,000 sometimes a night. So, you know, you know and this is... The 80s. This isn't, you know, you're talking about 80 at, at that time after Paul's hit. So it's 86 about, you know, Paul comes right back, uh, uh, Pete comes right back in Continental game, and I shake my head. And I said, well, I guess he's going to lose tonight. Like, you know, you know he's mm -hmm. not going to try to win it. Yeah. You know, he's scared for his life. <clears throat> not that there was any reason to, to kill him because what? he didn't have no pull uh, violently with anybody. P Pete was never involved in mobster. Pete was in mo involved, yeah. But he didn't have the the, the men. Nobody did. John has. The so guys then, how the quickly time. after is John? Is it if do they vote and everything's official? Oh, right away. And then he starts sending me as an errand boy to pull guys in and tell them I want to see him. He's telling me to go see Gallo. Tell this guy uh, he's retired. You know, go off to the sunset. And John starts. And no one's gonna challenge him. They're older guys. He's got the young guys. He's got. He's controlling all the. Street, he's got his brother who's very obviously loyal to him, a genie. Uh, and I like genie a lot on the street. I'm going to clarify that. I really like genie. I like Joey Scopo. Joey was one of, the, and Johnny Knig, I like, but Joey was one of the best guys. Even when they had my uh, bachelor party, Joey gave me $1,000 cash, which was big money back then. Yeah. You know, because we had it at Donna's. It was about 15 guys, 20 guys there. And uh, so, you know, when you talk about certain guys, you got to remember. You know, guys like Joey were, and that's why John knew he had the reach of other people in the loyalty. And then Joey had his guys always with him. He had a guy, Charlie Fish, with him all the time, who becomes a skipper. He had uh, uh, Chicky Alito and Angelo with him, and, you know, the, they were part of his crew at the time because different factions. But then later on, Chicky moves off with Andrew Russo, and then you have a third faction that develops. But uh, And then the Colombo family gets dismantled because... This is a couple of years later, they were all cooperating after all the bodies and everything. Everybody's cooperating, so that destroyed that family. So then how how many years is he in, in power, like really in power at his peak? John was only in power about five years. And then it's still he, a substantial time for that. Not really. That's the lifetime of of, of most bosses actually. Oh. That's it. Because it takes mm -hmm. the FBI yeah. A certain right. amount of years of surveillance as tapes informants and then they start clobbering through you and uh but it's almost like in a weird way it's almost like self-suicide when you become a boss like you know well you have guys like you know Carmine Persico that was running the, the families from jail and and the street and mostly in jail mm. and uh I, that's the guy I told you, who, you know, for people who know that protected uh, Madoff in jail. Right. And Persico was a dangerous but guy. When was that? That was... Well, Madoff? No. Well, Madoff was early 2000s. Yeah, but Carmine went to jail two years ago, and he, he was running the family through his sons on the street, so... But, like, and obviously... It wouldn't they have... don't want to give up the power. It's like John. He ran it from prison, too. As much as you're in prison, you're still taking all the money and you're, you're keeping the loyalists around you that are running things for you, taking the money in. And guys still fear these guys even from prison. Where are they putting the, the money? To hit. Where are they putting the money when you're in jail? And John never cared about money, so I don't know what he did with it. He gambled his money when he was on the street and he, he went out on, and, and partying around. That's what he liked to do. You know, he liked to go to clubs and he liked to be seen and he liked to sit in the champagne lounges and eat he liked good dinners 
He had a lot of, you know, celebrities around him like Jay Black. Yes, we have a lot in common. The Americans, it? you know, he had a lot of, you know, so, and uh, th he wasn't the typical. He didn't want to open a hundred businesses. He didn't care about it. Huh. Interesting. He never had any legitimate businesses to wash. No, and... he was he was on the books as as uh, Arc Plumbing as an employee for Arc Plumbing. <laughs> that was also down the block. It was the Garinos That's hilarious. that had that company. So. Uh, you know, it, it, he, listen. He knows all these guys since they're young, so he's they. You know, they're all doing whatever he says and taking care of him. And and uh, yes, it, but he lived in an average house. He didn't have some mansion somewhere. He didn't care. I mean, later on, he he, he buys the big body Benz. But before that, like everybody, everybody had Lincolns. You had a nicer house than him. Oh yeah, <laughs> I had an estate. I know, I know. But so he didn't. His didn't even. He didn't care. He could have bought one. If so, he then it. so then what's so then what's the point? He didn't have to buy one. They were, he had so, a million guys so would have gave him one. So then what's the point? Just crazy ego that like I want to be the guy. And it wasn't even. I mean, listen. I shouldn't say he didn't have an ego. He had an ego, but it wasn't even the ego. He just loved the street. He loved it. That's all he knew. And his father. You know, he didn't have a good father. His, his grandma. His his mother Fanny was a really good woman. She raised all the boys. The father was never around. He used to say it himself. My father's a fucking bum. Little Johnny, you know, a big uh, Papa John, he's called, and and uh, but he was a de degenerate gambler. But John was nice to his father. Honestly, the father would beat the fuck out of him when they were younger, and you know he was never around, and he was a gambler. He was degenerate, and as much as John would say that when he was mad and yell at his father, he would also, and his father used to fight. Even as an old man, he knocked out a couple of guys. <laughs> father was tough, but. He would come around and he'd say he's a fucking bum and he'd throw him a couple thousand to go to the track or whatever he was doing. So as much as he was mad at him and he raised him shitty and he wasn't a good father to them, he did take care of him. That's why John had no... He didn't care about money. He really didn't care. Took care of a lot of bum guys. And you know, some nice guys hung around. You know, little Johnny was the gatekeeper of the place, clean up the streets, took care of him. Jimmy Irish, some different guys. Uh, Fat Bob, who used to pick out his clothes and... Is his errand boy from basically, you know, he took care of all these guys. So then let's talk about his downfall. What what was the start of the downfall in your eyes? Downfall is hitting Paul. I mean, in my eyes, you didn't have to hit him. I know that he thought he was going to shelve him, but I don't think he would even shelve them. He had too many problems. And I, I think Paul was, although Paul was very smart, and he wasn't stupid either. He knew John was getting power. Everybody knew he was getting power, so he was intimidated. John, he might not have shown it in certain ways, because he's the boss. And then you got to remember, Paul was very close to all the families because he's making them big money. And and the Genovese family, the Casey family, these guys are making money with Paul. Right. I mean, Paul's a billionaire, so he's not the uh, average boss. And so when you're bringing in that kind of money, nobody wants to see him die because they have alliances in business with him, in construction and the cement industry and different things. So. So then, but he's still, even after the hit, though, he's still, I mean, he's still around for some time. Yeah, five years. I mean, after the hit, he's around five years. Uh, so. And I had the detective, actually, I got the information from Joe Coffey, who was a cop that was talking to Phil Baroni that worked with me, did murders with me, sold drugs with me, a bookmaking partner of mine. And, uh, and now, uh, he did everything, armed robberies with me. He did, so he's the one that gave me the information that I gave to John that you're gonna get hit with this case, with this Rico case. John didn't blink, blink an eye, I gotta say. He was like, all right. <laughs> he didn't really, he just, I guess he didn't realize how serious this Do you think was. he always knew he was gonna die? Like 100%. it- 100%. Like he just knew it was a matter of time. 100%. That's why he didn't give a fuck. Yeah, you, I gotta it, tell you, he really didn't give a fuck. <laughs> you know, these guys were those, oh, he, you know, he died like a man. No, he didn't die like a man, he died without dignity. He was choking on his own spit. He was chained to a bed, and he lived like an animal because of what Sammy did, right? And this is the part I don't understand. How, think about where's the loyalty? How hard is it to go kill this guy? Easy. He, he can hide anywhere he wanted to hide. And he, it's not that difficult. And that'll just show you about the loyalty of that bullshit. Like, nobody wants to go do that for him while he's in jail, dying and suffering. I mean, that's that's the truth of that life. So when someone's trying to sell you a bullshit dream, uh, 
This is just the way it works. No one cares. What year? Did, what was the last time he go? To, uh, he went to jail. What year was that? He went away in uh, ninety one. And then he dies. He dies in two thousand and two, I think. Wow. That's so so when does he stop having any power? He kept power for a long time uh, because he kept his family in the positions of running everything. Right. And he also kept Jackie Nose, also who was a loyalist to his, not a tough guy, just a guy that had relationships with people through through John, really, brought him in and through the Gambino faction of people. In Italy, Jackie had relations. So Jackie was just a guy, again, they're just guys they put in these positions because they're doing the bidding for John. And, you know, John's keeping them safe and maneuvering from prison uh, and uh, so you know the, the loyalty is going to stay there they're not that's why you, these guys when they go oh he was a boss not in the sense that they understand they just don't get it so uh, when these guys are he's not a violent guy Jack he's not killing nobody he's not hurting nobody it's right. not what he does right uh, um, but you know they, they hold you know they, they keep a hold on everything mm -hmm. from there from prison. I mean, Vicky Muso did it with the Lucchese family for a long time. Tony Ducks did it. You know, these guys all, they, they try to run things from prison. Uh, so, so how many years would you say if after 91 he, he held power? I mean, he kept power the, the whole way through until he died. I mean, you know, how much power it's, it diminishes right. as it's going. I mean, you got to remember something. Like when he was, I'll give you a, a, something that, in 1992, we have a sit-down. Uh, I'm there, Mikey Scars, uh, his son, and uh, we have it at this guy Anthony's house, who's a friend of, uh, of his son's, and uh, we meet with the Genovese family. There's uh, Barney and a couple of his guys. And, you know, we're outside. They go inside talking. They, the father sends, God, he sends a message home to stop the killing in the street. And they agree, yes, yes, yes. And then shortly after the agreement, I says, I'm not buying that. And, you know, I told some, hey, they ain't, they ain't, no, they ain't holding no water. And then right after they killed Joey Scope. So, you know, and Johnny Pop, Papa, for the people who don't know, I know Johnny since he's a kid. He was a young kid. He killed about four or five guys. He's t 21 years old. And he'd come around, he's very quiet. You know, he didn't say nothing. But his father was Johnny Papa, also was a Genovese made guy mm. that, uh, gets killed uh, early on because he did two murders with the Gen without the Genovese family's permission. And the, the, the chin has him killed because he did two hits without his permission. So they get rid of him because he's a loose cannon. They, they hit him. Johnny, the son, wants to do the same thing. He actually kills. He's in church. Johnny, the one who kills Joey Scope, who's his, gonna be, uh, Johnny Papa is going to be a best, not a best man, but a groomsman to his friend. And his friend's brother, John, uh, I forget the last name, something with an S, whatever his name, last name was. And the FBI go in after him. And they're trying to, everybody doesn't know what's going on, and it comes out, and he throws his gun under one of the pews, and he he, he uh, surrenders to the FBI. They came in from everywhere. And uh, it comes out that he killed this, not only killed him, he butchered him, uh, Johnny Pablo, his friend. He killed two of his friends. Uh, over not nonsense because he thought they were taking credit for his uh, killing of Joey Scopo. But on Joey Scopo, and I brought this up before, when they shoot him, they're scared to go near him when he goes down. He's not dead, but he's got a cell phone. They think maybe it's a gun, uh -huh. and Joey abuses him. You, he starts calling him a punk and everything else. That's why I said Joey was, and there's no thing about dying, don't get me wrong, but one of his neighbors came out and was there you know, comforting him. And then his son came out and kind of woke him up. Mm -hmm. And Joey was really good for, I loved his son. He, he was always with him when he was a baby. He was to walk him down to us. And and he he really was a good father, good husband. He had a good wife. Really, that's why I said you can't say enough, but this is what happens in shitty life. You know, the, the his son's mm -hmm. got to see him dying on the street. And he, he, he makes it to the hospital and dies in the hospital a couple hours later. His... Son-in-law, I believe, was driving the car. I don't think he got hit. His nephew got hit in the hand, I think, and his finger and the shoulder, uh, which uh, he he's okay after that. Only, I think, one or two bullets hit Joey. I think one in the belly and one up top somewhere. And uh, he, he bleeds out. But the thing about that life, again, is he died in front of his, right. his kid. He scarred yeah. him for life. 
and but he was listen one of the toughest guys out there and one of the most nicest guys out there and I that's why recently I said you know we got to do more on him when when John was in jail did you ever visit him did you ever no I can't go to him yeah, yeah. did you ever like send messages out he would Pete would go visit him especially so, his MCC so the last time you had a direct contact with him was 91 91 he's talking to Pete Gotti and they asked me to hit Dennis Harrigan uh, as a favor to Tommy Karate which I didn't want to do and Pete said that he just left his brother he told me wait well originally Pete says wait at the club for me my brother wants to see me so Pete goes what the fuck did you do now <laughs> I'm laughing <laughs> I go I don't know what I did <laughs> so I said, who the fuck do I do? So I'm waiting at the club, you know, I'm nervous. I'm like, who did I, who did I do what to now that he's mad? And uh, so to show you, he still has power, right? Because right, right. he's still scared. And, you know, at the time, you know, you, you look up to the guy and you're like, all right, let's see what he says. And then I ask Pete, I take a walk with him. He goes, he wants you to hit Dennis Harrigan because Dennis is cooperating against Tommy <sighs> Karate. But I don't like Tommy Karate. Me and Phil Baroni, the cop, and right. Keith Pellegrino rob his drug spot. You know, uh, prior to that, I talk about, and everybody's always, you know, these guys were all live. Go check with them. <laughs> you know what people question. Yeah. Anyway, I said to Pete Dwight, is it an order? Do I have to do it? Is he saying, I got to do it? Or he says, no, he's not asking you, uh, ordering it. He said, if you want to do it, you do it as a favor. But he owed Tommy a favor because Tommy's the one that killed Willie Boy Johnson with a couple of guys at the bus stop when he was waiting to go to construction work. So it was a favor back. I didn't do it. Everybody believed I did it for years. The whole family did. So then... So Dennis gets hit, but I, I didn't do it. And later on it comes out, I believe, who they think did it, but it wasn't me. And how... What do you think the last couple years for Gotti in jail were like? Do you think he... He suffered. He, he, got, he got hurt. You know, he's an older guy. You how know, old was he, he got, when he... He got... Uh, I mean, he was like a 50, I guess, at the time, something like that. I mean, not really old. Though, yeah. But, you know, you so he would be in young, his But he's sick. You know, 80s. he's sick. He's, he doesn't know he's sick. And he runs into Guy Johnson that uh, attacks him. And, you know, people say what they want. And listen, they, everybody's got a big mouth. They want to talk. When uh. The guy's an older guy. He ain't 30 years old. How are you going to fight him back? I yeah. mean, you know, guys sucker punched him and then, you know, got on top of him and pummeled him. It can happen to anybody. I mean, listen, if John could have got near him again, you know, he, John, you know, then you grab a knife or something and stab him up. But that ain't going to happen because they separate him, they transfer him, and uh, this is what goes on in jail. It's a young man's place, and, and that's first off. Second, John's sick, you know, and he didn't know he was sick, but he was sick. And then later on, he's, you know, he, he's suffering bad, you know, with throat cancer. He's not getting the right medical yeah. You know, I could tell you how many guys I watched die in jail because they couldn't get medical help. Yeah. They sent one guy, cowboy, back to the unit, said he had stomach uh, acid only. He was having a heart attack. He went back, and uh, they let him die. Another guy, they gave him a, uh, a shot. He was diabetic, and they gave him the wrong shot. They killed him. This goes on a regular. Crazy. These, these guys, uh, the medical stuff in jail is a joke. So, uh, I mean, he suffered. It's suffering. And you... Chained up and terrible, really. What was the first time when? So two thousand one is when he dies. He dies, I think two thousand two. And you had gone on the and you went on the run. What's the? I forget the. I went on the run right around a little after that, two thousand and three. When did? Okay, so when did you find? Who told you that when Gotti passed? No, I knew I was in jail. I right when he passed, because I went oh. in and out. I was, I got out close to two thousand, end of ninety nine, two thousand. I went back in in two thousand and one. Got out, I went back in again in 2002 on another violation. Got out, and I went on a run in 2003. What was, so what was your reaction when you found out he died? I mean, listen, you said because you grew up with the guy. It's like anything else. You know, it's, everybody's going to tell you, but you weren't surprised. fuck him. You're going to hear people say, oh, he killed all kinds of right. people, this and that. And, you know, you're going to hear bad things. Everybody, listen, everybody's always bashing everybody. It's just part of life. But, you know, you know him since a kid, so you think about some of the good things. You think about the New Year's Eve at his house yeah. and the champagne. And, and you think about some of the nice things he did for you. I mean, listen, saved my life just with Richie uh, Raybach. Yeah. With the case when I, you know, I stabbed a guy in the throat. I stabbed another guy in the belly in a, in a place in Pompano. 
uh, the guy Ernie owned it. I forget his last name, but anyway, the place was packed. They get pinched right at the scene. They undress me right there. I got full of blood. And then, you know, they take me in my underwear. Uh, Joe Butcher's son was there watching the whole thing, front row seat. Uh, who was the captain was around John, and later on, the son gets straightened out. And uh, me and him used to go out a little bit, double date with girls when we were younger and different things. But anyway, he was there, and you know, it's part of the life. You know, some it's just a crazy life. What do you think Gotti's legacy is? And and in your mind, you I mean, you always spoke highly of him. Like you, you only hold him in kind of the highest. No, I said some bad things when you're mad. I guess you know. I I didn't say all good. But overall, I, you know, obviously I like the guy. was with him every day. You looked up to him. You know, we all say things because you're annoyed. You know, you, you're hurt, you're annoyed, you're mad, whatever. You know, you just you look back and you're judging him. It's easy to, you know, be that quarterback after everything happened. But overall, he was good to the guys that he that he liked. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he really was good to the guys he liked. He treated you good. You know, he'd throw you money. You know, different different things like that. He'd treat you right at the table. He didn't, you know, he couldn't have told me to go sit in the back somewhere else. He he gave me, he let everybody know, you're going to respect this guy. Right. He's doing work. By his actions, not saying it, he's letting them know this guy's work. He's doing work. You know, when you hit that seat, you know, he'd give it all the guys. Because the other guys that got made, too, that weren't, didn't fit at the table. He wouldn't, he wouldn't remove me and put me at the, the other table. Mm -hmm. He kept me at that table, so... And you have that same seat, basically, you'd sit in every week. All right. I think we covered it A to Z. Um, yeah, I mean, I think... And I think I... I watched Fear City because you were in it. I'll, I'll watch, I guess, the, the, the totality of Get Gotti, but it's crazy. Like, he became really a pop figure. Like, he's in rap songs. Like, you know, he's... People are... People are... People are uh, you know... Anybody that doesn't know about any life, whether it's the mob, they, they're intrigued by it. If you're a ball player, they're intrigued by yeah, it. Yeah. You know, in any position you don't really live in, there's a lot of actors and stuff I'm friends with now, right, that they like this part of life because they're not intrigued. But if, and then there's people that are like, wow, it's mm -hmm. Sylvester Stallone. But, you know, it's Sylvester Stallone really like God. And was, you know, because you're intrigued by what you're not mm -hmm. involved in. Mm -hmm. That's just, I think, normal you know yeah fantasy of people's lives you know what they think about. well if you watched this all the way through we appreciate you make sure you hit that like button comment below what are your thoughts on john Gotti senior um what's your thoughts on joey scopo too joey scopo as well uh subscribe to our channel as always and we'll be back next week with some uh some more fantastic content for y'all see everybody subscribe <laughs>